this represents a lot of money coming onto the boat and you're probably going to be out on the town for a few nights when you get home. Hey GQ, I'm Jeremy Wade. Today I'm going to be reviewing fishing scenes. This is The Breakdown. First up, a river runs through it. So what you do before you even start fishing, you will actually look at the water and you will try and work out, you know, what's my best bet. And often what tells you uh, what to do is if you look around, if you see insects flying, uh, these might be insects that have hatched from larvae in the water. So it tells you that there's going to be maybe floating insects or insects hatching on the surface. What he's using there is a floating fly. Something that some people might be wondering watching this is how do you get a tiny little fly that weighs next to nothing? How do you present that uh, on top of a fish? And the fact is that weight in itself isn't enough to, 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 to get the, the fly out there. So what you're using is, um, is quite thick special line, sort of weighted line. Now the fly isn't directly tied to that thick line, you, you will have a, a fine leader of very thin line. It's the weight of the fly line propels the fine leader with the fly on the end. There. The way that you detect the fish has taken it's not really just waiting for something to pull the rod, you are watching. Uh, you are watching for the fish to come up and take that fly off the surface, and then you're reacting to it. These fish are wild animals. They are very alive to something that is moving unnaturally. So if that fly is not drifting in the correct way, uh, you might have bubbles on the surface, for example. If that fly is, is sort of out of sync with everything else on the surface, the trout is going to suspect something and it won't take it. So what happened there, um, the fish took and then he set the hook and when that happens the first thing the fish wants to do is, is head in the opposite direction. If you hold the line that fine leader is going to break so what you have to do is you have to let the fish, you have to let the fish take line but you, what you do is you calibrate the resistance that you give. So what you're trying to do is enable it to take line uh, but not quite exert enough force to break the fine leader. And if you do this correctly, it can be pretty hectic in the moment, but you do it correctly, that fish will eventually tire out and you can bring it in. But if you try and bring it straight in, it's gone. It's quite uh, interesting to, to see what they're wearing, the sort of the waistcoats and the hats and all the rest of it. Nowadays, uh, fly anglers would be kitted up. They'd probably have a, a vest with multiple pockets to hold all their different bits of gear in. Nowadays, you'd also have uh, polarizing glasses. You know, that would really help you to see the fish that you're maybe trying to cast to. Quite likely in that kind of situation, they'd be wearing chest waders. Now, the thing is, the worst case scenario there is if you go over uh, the top of your waders, water's going to come in. That's going to take you down. It's going to be very hard to get out of the water. One thing you can do to guard against that is you have a belt around your middle and that will slow that process down. That fish is running downstream. He is getting into some deep water there and in this kind of situation, that, that is what you would do. If the fish heads downstream, you're not going to get it back, so you've got to try and follow it. You could maybe follow it on the bank, but if you do that on those boulders, they're quite slippery, you risk slipping, you risk turning your ankle. If you get in the water though, I mean, even shallower than that, sometimes a rocky river, that can be pretty tricky, it can be quite dangerous. Uh, the water can carry you down if you get your foot stuck between boulders. Uh, a lot of people have drowned in that kind of situation. However, fishermen are genetically uh, incapable of letting go of the rod when something is on the end. He 
he's, he's doing very well to keep his hat on. I thought it was coming off there, but it seemed to sort of land back again. He doesn't seem to have any kind of strap. The hat is not just vanity. The, the, the hat keeps, uh, what it does, it shades the, the sun out of your eyes. And so you can actually uh, watch the water a lot better with a, a wide brimmed hat. In trout fishing terms, this is quite a long fight. I mean, it's a decent fish from a river like that. I'm thinking now to some of the fights I've had with fish, and the longest one, let me see, I've had a couple around the four hour mark, but the longest was four and a half hours. Next up, castaway. Some anglers might be slightly shocked to hear this, but I have fished with a spear. I've spent quite a lot of time uh, fishing with uh, indigenous fishermen and uh, I have used a spear. Generally speaking, when I've used one, it's been more of a sort of a jab. For example, in the Amazon, you know, sometimes you creep around, you see a fish, you jab it and you hang on to the spear. So yeah, it's, it doesn't always have to be rod and line. And if you're in a survival situation like this, you're gonna use any method you can. It should speak a lot to, to every angler because all of fishing is about ingenuity. It's about what you can do with whatever you've got at hand. The thing about spearing fish, for example, is, I mean, in every situation where you can see the fish nice and clearly, they can see you. So that doesn't mean you're, you've got no chance of success, but it means you have to go into super stealth mode. And one thing you've got to avoid doing is, uh, fish are also sensitive to vibrations, so don't crash around, tread very lightly. And one thing that's very important is try not to break the skyline. So look behind you. You don't want to be forming a, a big silhouette against the sky. So uh, if you can get into a position where, the, where there might be trees, you don't have to have trees or stuff in front of you, but if you've got stuff behind you, that will make it harder for the fish to see you. Okay, eating raw fish is something that people do sometimes in fancy restaurants. That doesn't look particularly appetizing there, but again, this is a survival situation. Eating raw fish is something I have done in a non-restaurant situation. I've eaten uh, sashimi piranha in the Amazon uh, with this guy who was brought up uh, with a tribe. And what we did, we just cut a fillet out of the back of this piranha. Uh, we put a bit of lime juice on it, a um, little bit of salt, a little bit of something called uh, urukum, it's like a red powder. And that was actually really tasty. You've got to be a little bit careful eating raw fish. Um, some of them have parasites in them. There's also some fish, particularly around reefs, uh, have a certain, the meat has a toxin, and this originates in single-celled algae, and the toxin works its way up the food chain, and this can cause slight diarrhea, vomiting, even heart problems. I was actually on a shoot a few years ago, and we rescued a castaway. I mean, this sounds incredible, but we, we were, uh, in the Gulf of Carpentaria off Northern Australia, and we were just puttering down the coast of this uninhabited island. And this guy just appeared from nowhere, and he'd been there for nearly three days. He'd got lost, and he was almost at the, the, the limit of the time that is possible to survive uh, without water. So um, he was very pleased to see us, and he's still going strong. Next up, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. This is the bait. Little fishes. That's right. Now what are we gonna do with these little fishes? And big fishes. That's right. I'm liking this already. People are starting to realize that fishing is really good for mental health. In fact, the health service here in the UK where I live, they are starting to prescribe fishing to people who are suffering anxiety, depression, PTSD, military veterans. That's it. Crunchy right through. All right, now you got it. Anybody who's looking closely at the gear here, they might see little, little swivels on there. And I think if you don't have something in the line while you're doing that, the line might get twisted up, it might, it might kink. And so uh, the, the purpose of a swivel is just to sort of uh, take those kinks out of the line. Take your bottom hook. You got it? Yeah. You take it and you push it all the way through. Teaching people to fish is potentially very satisfying, but it's also, uh, it can be quite frustrating because there's a certain amount of intricacy. There's the risk that if you're moving around on the sea, somebody's gonna impale themselves on a hook.
the chairs they were using is a little bit sort of non-standard, just these sort of stackable chairs. And I think on a boat, uh, if things start to move around a bit, they're going to start sliding around. That's the kind of thing you might expect people to be sitting on in a, some kind of town hall or something. I just go straight. Straight as an arrow, Charlie. Straight, man? Just straight, that's right. But Mac! Back, this thing ain't too steady, Mac. Mac! I'm sure it's not uh, good nautical practice just to let anyone drive the boat. I was once on an Amazon river boat uh, at night that was traveling very fast across a lake and I, everyone else was asleep. I wandered up to the wheelhouse and I'm looking out onto the water. I can't see a thing. I'm so impressed by this guy's eyesight. And when he noticed that I was there, he turned to me and he said, uh, can you see anything out there? I said, no, I can't. He said, yeah, he said, no, neither can I. Next up, the perfect storm. They're fishing for swordfish, and the technique that's being used here is long lining. So you've got basically one very long line, uh, which is paid out into the ocean, and it'll probably have floats at, at, at intervals. And then at intervals along that, there will be hooks and baits. And then after a period of time, they will bring in the long line. And some of the hooks won't have anything on them, but some of them will have fish on. So how they're bringing them on board, what they're doing, they're gaffing them, uh, which is a long pole with a strong metal hook on the end. Uh, they might even get a couple in there, but that way you're going to make sure that you get the fish on the deck. You know, just another detail there, you could see there was one guy over to the left and he's just, he's just bringing in that main line. And then the guys on the right, they are dealing with the this sort of branch line with the, with the fish on. So yeah, this is all, it, it's all good authentic stuff. Yeah, lots of smiles, they're looking very happy. Uh, the thing about commercial fishing is it's, it's sort of like gambling in a way. Um, you, can, you can have bad days, you can have very bad days, and you can have good days. And certainly with swordfish, um, the value of the fish, if you catch them, is very high. And, and what tends to happen is that the, the owner of the boat takes a big cut of any income, but there's a residue that is divided up amongst the crew. Yeah, so what they're doing there, they're, they're taking the fish down and they're putting them on ice. And before they do that, they are removing the guts. And, and this makes perfect sense because uh, if you leave the guts in, then some of what's in there will sort of migrate to the meat and it might make the meat spoil. And also you, with that cavity there, you can then pack with ice. So when you're fishing, uh, the weather is always something that you need to take into consideration. And generally speaking, you should be prepared for bad weather. I have been caught out in storms before. Also, if, it's, if the weather gets that bad, you stop fishing. Particularly, well, I, I use a lot of carbon fiber rods these days. And uh, if you're holding a carbon fiber rod, poking up in the air, that is potentially gonna act as a lightning conductor. Actually, there was one time I was fishing it wasn't even during a storm, it was after a storm. Uh, this was in the afternoon, this was, it was in Suriname in South America, and the storm had moved on. So myself and the crew, we went out into the middle of the river, we disembarked on this rock island, and we are filming something with a local fisherman, and suddenly, just out of nowhere, there's this almighty crack and a, a flash of light. And without even thinking about it, I just, I just hit the deck. And we ran for our boat, when we got to our boat, this long wooden canoe, there was somebody just flat out in the bottom of it, and that was our sound recordist, and he'd been hit. Uh, he, he later said he just saw this ball of fire in front of his face. We had to get on the sat phone, get some medical advice. He didn't lose consciousness, he was okay. Um, he was missing a patch of hair from one of his legs. You've got to respect the weather, and particularly storms. Next up, the saint. There you are, Mr. Temple. Thanks, Des. Okay. Right, nice, nice little detail there. They're, they're clipping the line into the outrigger, so, so from the end of the rod, the, the line doesn't go straight back into the water. It's, uh, there's like a, an arm coming off the side of the boat, and what that does, it uh, just holds it away from the boat for a while. Now we can relax and enjoy the morning. The 
rest is up to the fish. You make it seem so easy, Simon. My husband worries and fusses from the minute he comes on board. This is uh, yeah, a sort of massive error here. The, the reel that he's using is, he's got it on the wrong side of the rod. This is uh, what they call uh, a multiplier reel. It normally sits on top of the rod. Uh, he's got it sort of hanging underneath. Uh, he's also wearing a harness, and the reason you've got this harness, you know, that's clipped into the reel. So if the reel's underneath, then I don't know what the harness is doing. That can't be clipped in correctly. The purpose of that harness is to, uh, if you try and play a fish like that, just holding the rod, your, your arms are, are going to give way uh, eventually uh, if, it's, if it's a big fish. So you have a harness that goes around your shoulders, it attaches to the reel, and that means that your back, even your legs, can, can take the strain of the fish. He's got it. No, not yet. He's just ramming it. He thinks it's alive. He wants to kill it. What we've got here, we've got real footage of a marlin coming after a, a bait. And then there is a definite sense that they are not in the same place. They're in a studio somewhere. The script is pretty good. What the script is saying is, is, is spot on. Basically, Marlin will, they'll come and investigate something, and often they will maybe knock it with the, uh, with, with the bill. So what happened there, the, the line is actually in a bit of a clip. So it goes from his rod tip to this clip out the side of the boat. And when the Marlin takes, it pulls it out of that. Yeah, that's actually true as well. Again, the script is good because the skipper there is saying, you know, you take it fairly easy, keep it fairly gentle. It all depends on the boat. And very often it, it is the, it's not so much the person sitting in the chair with the rod, it is, it, is the, it is the skipper, it is the crew. You know, they are the ones who really sort of choreograph the, uh, the bringing in of the fish. If he can snap it that easily, why doesn't he? fish doesn't know it's a 36 thread line. He doesn't know anything except he wants to get away. What she said, actually, uh, a lot of people um are going to be thinking the same thing. If you're using really heavy gear, why don't you wind the fish straight in? But the fact is, a fish that size, you're never going to wind it straight in. What you have to do, you have to tire it out first. And the way you tire it out is if it decides it wants to run, you've got to let it run. And then when you feel it tiring, you start to gain some line. So it's a bit of a dance, you know, it takes some line, you bring it in. Even if you had ridiculously strong line, like a cable, a metal cable, the risk then would be you just tear the hook out of its mouth. Oh. <laughs> right, that's, that's actually hilarious because um, suddenly we've got a cutaway which is taken from over uh, the fisherman's shoulder and suddenly everything is correct. The, uh, the reel is the right way round. I can't see any evidence of a harness there, but you've got a massive muscular arm uh, with a very tight watch where it's been flopping around a bit before and, and some, some bare legs. So let's see if he puts his trousers back on in time for the main shot. See what I mean about snapping a 36 red line? Right, he's just lost the fish and there was just a, a, a very quick shot there of something swimming away. But it looked as if it had a hole in the back of its head, so I think that was a shot of a dolphin, not a marlin at all. You know, it's a big thing in the water, but um, with a pointy bit on the front, but a hole in the back of its head. And finally, the old man and the sea. What's happening here is authentic. This is him handlining a marlin, and we're, we're talking serious hardcore there. Just a rope, the hook's on the end, and this is a seriously big fish. This is several hundred pounds that's there. I have actually handline fished for marlin, which is a crazy thing to do. Nobody in their right mind these days does it. I was using nylon monofilament line, which is even worse than rope, thinner, and I hooked a fish that was not as big as this one, it was probably two or three hundred pounds. Had it on for an hour, got it to the side of the boat. I'd seen it jump out of the water, but it's down beneath the boat, and after an hour, the hook just popped out. So I feel for him, I've, I've been in a similar situation. This is what we waited for. Now let us take it. Make him pay for the line. Make him pay for it. When you are bringing that line in, it looked like he moved to put it round behind his back. But the, the other thing that you're tempted to do, because it's very hard to grip, the temptation is to take a wrap, to, to, to wrap that line round your hand. Now, uh, 
in this situation, this is potentially extremely dangerous. Uh, if you're going to take that wrap, you want to wrap down the line. And if that happens, uh, if the fish suddenly takes off, you just open your hand and it comes off your hand and, and you're safe. If you do it the wrong way, if you wrap, if I wrap between my hand and me, if that fish then takes, you've got the risk of a knot uh, and you are going over the side of the boat. And if you can't free yourself, that's, you know, we're talking fatality there. I'm hearing a sound there. I'm hearing this, which is the sound that a rope makes. When a fish is running and that rope is going over the side of the boat, uh, you, you hear this sound. And what it does, it actually eats into the wood at the side of the boat and you get a nice groove there eventually. Uh, but what's happening is, is that that sound, which is an authentic sound, is coming at the wrong moment. You're seeing him actually, you're seeing a stationary line or he's even bringing line in. So, that, so it's a good sound effect, but it's being used in the wrong place. All this is authentic. I mean, these fish are just incredible. They will throw themselves out of the water, even fish weighing several hundred pounds. What they're trying to do is, you know, clearly they, you know, they're trying to, there's something in their mouth, they're trying to shake it clear. Every time it jumps and then crashes back in the water, what marlin will eventually do, they, they will, they'll go into another mode. They'll then start going deep and it's just the, you know, the, the weight and the, the stamina of the fish that you're, you're up against. That was interesting. Uh, nice shot, cut away to the floor of the boat. Now, when it comes in, in this kind of situation, you're not um, putting it into neat coils. Uh, you haven't got time to do that. It's, it's basically gonna be all over the floor of the boat. It's gonna be a mess. And that is just not an aesthetic consideration. That is a safety consideration. Because if you've got line all over the bottom of the boat, uh, there is a risk then. If you get your foot in a coil, uh, again, if that fish takes off, your foot is caught in a coil, you are going over the side of the boat. What you should have in that kind of situation, you should have a knife, a knife handy. He will begin to circle soon. Let the fight come. He's getting tired, and he would be, because this is, okay, this is a clip that's a few minutes long. In reality, we're, we're talking a process of hours. Uh, we are talking exhaustion, to the point where however much you want that fish, Part of you is, is just wanting it to be over. If the boy were here, he could wet the coils of the line, he thought. Yes, if the boy were here, if the boy were here. He's saying he hasn't got an assistant. You need an assistant to tidy up the line in the boat, but also you know, get some water on it because that, that line is going through your hands. It's gonna burn your hands. The fish was circling slowly and the old man was wet with sweat and tired deep into his bones. So what happens at the end here? Um, you know, what an ending to this story. The sharks came and, and ate the marlin, which must have been heartbreaking. It, it, it is a real threat. I mean, sharks are, they're predatory. They are tuned in to opportunities, particularly an easy meal, because, you know, if, if, if you're a shark and you're, and you're just trying to chase fish in the water, they're gonna run away. But a fish on a line is actually quite vulnerable. Uh, and as that fish gets tired, I've had fish myself that have been bitten in half by sharks. What you try and do is you try and get that fish in as quickly as possible. You know, use strong gear, get it in quickly so that the shark doesn't get a chance. And even though this is a big fish here, uh, this is a vulnerable fish. Okay, that's it. Hope you learned something. Till next time. <laughs>